Good afternoon, everybody. We have managed to um, have a few words with Randy Oliver between his lectures today and uh, just wanted to ask him a few questions about um, how he came to be here and the sort of work that he's doing and um, what he thinks of the show, because I think it's your first time that you visited. My first time here, Val, and uh, thank you for having me here. Yeah, it's, it's quite a show. Have we given you a few minutes to have a look around? I have had a few minutes and uh, enjoyed visiting the uh, the, the books, bookseller. Um, um, uh, what's his, the name? Northern B Books, Jeremy. Jeremy, yes. yes. And found some uh, very old uh, books written around the turn of the century, um, which I find to be very, very interesting, very hard to find in the United States. So I'm taking you know, like five of them uh, back home because the beekeepers back then were very good observers. They weren't so much laboratory uh, researchers. They were people who lived in the hive. And many of their observations back then are, were very, very trenchant for beekeeping today and apply. And uh, I pulled the quote out of one uh, last night, added to a slideshow today. Excellent. Yeah, Jeremy and the collection of books that he's got and his knowledge about the older books yes. as well um, is absolutely, it's, he's a sort of backbone of the show, really. Really. And did you manage to have a look at um, Eric's photographic exhibition? Oh, God. Well? Eric is a spectacular photographer. Uh, very much in, enjoyed them. Yes. Mike Palmer and I went down and looked at the pictures all uh, one by one. Yes. Excellent. So tell us something about your research. I think you're an independent researcher. You're not Indep attached to a university. Correct. I'm going to have university degrees. Um, but after I uh, graduated and um, uh, became a, a beekeeper, and then when Varroa started to kick my butt, I said, I've, I've got degrees in entomology and in uh, animal culture. Um, why am I letting a bug kick my butt? And I self-educated, um, went back, hit all the books, caught up on all the research, um, made connections with researchers world, worldwide. And, um, um, and then one day was uh, um, asked to write an article and, uh, did that and then asked to write more. And next thing I knew, I was invited to um, um, start speaking at conventions, surprised the heck out of me. And then um, I decided to start doing some of my research. What I, since I'm not affiliated with a university and I don't need to uh, write grants or anything like that, um, I can research whatever I want. And beekeepers encouraged me to do that. So all my research is supported by donations from beekeepers, mostly the United States and Canada, but wor worldwide. And uh, I don't, <laughs> I don't do it for a profit, um, but enough that covers my out of pocket expenses. And um, wherever I see holes in, in research, um, the big lack I see in research is the small amount of applied research in agriculture. In, if you look at plant culture, much of the research is applied research, something that the farmer can take right from the paper and apply to growing their crop. With beekeeping, that's not the case. But there's a whole lot of molecular biology research, there's a whole lot of other laboratory research, or research written, published mainly for the advancement of that researcher. <laughs> they get publications. As far as applied research, doesn't necessarily get you published in a major journal. So it's not an advantage to a, uh, an academic to focus on applied research, which often involves field work. Um, field, so I focus on field research, where I, I see that there's holes, uh, mainly uh, from questions that come me. I get emails every day from around the world of beekeepers asking me questions. And if I can't refer them to published research to answer their question, that's a hole. And then I, I also collaborate with university researchers and USD researchers and, and co-published papers and are all come up with a, something and they will get a scientific publication out of it in a peer reviewed journal and I'll get a publication in my journal. So I do the actual field work, they'll do the lab work and we, we both benefit. So it's a, um, I mean, an, an unusual situation, kind of unique. This does sound very unusual, yes. And really I applaud it. It's, um... It's unique. It sounds as if it benefits everybody. It does. So what at the moment is the focus of your current research projects? Well, last year I focused largely upon uh, development of better pollen subs, focusing on what is it about, why do some pollen subs perform better than others? 
So I am uh, in another other unique thing. I'm in an area where there is a long pollen dearth, where there, I have yards, apiaries, locations, where there's no pollen coming in at all. If you do not artificially feed a, a colony, it will die you know, for lack of protein com wow. coming in. So I can have negative control groups. What happens to colonies that set out that are not given supplemental feed and many of them just die, they dwindle away to nothing. Most places you can't do that because there's a small amount of pollen. Yeah. So you really can't do really good field research on testing uh, the benefit of a pollen sub, a sub an artificial diet. So I'm able to take a number of artificial diets. I can have a positive control group where I feed natural pollen to them, a negative control group where I feed just equal amount of sugar to them. And then I can also test the various pollen subs on the market and then have them analyzed and tease out what correlates of, of what their, their components are of that pollen sub, how that correlates with performance. And I came up with some very surprising results. It wasn't the uh, amount of protein. It wasn't the amount of lipids. It wasn't the sterols. It uh, wasn't apparently the trace elements. So many of the things that people are publishing on, that wasn't it. It was getting the correct balance of the essential amino acids seemed to outweigh everything else. So um, uh, that was last year. Um, this year, I, I'm largely working on um, the natural treatments, oxalic acid, formic acid, uh, thymol, and the essential oils. Um, I'm doing deep dive into oxalic acid. I've de developed a, a simple technique of titration that you can apply an oxalic treatment to a hive. And then I can go back in after 10 minutes, an hour, a day, a month, pluck out 10 bees and about 15 seconds of bee, titrate how many micrograms of acid are still on their bodies and how it's distributed throughout the hive. So I can take 10 bees from an outer comb, 10 bees from the center and go bing, 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 very quick. I'll be publishing how to do that. But that's open, can open our eyes as to how best to apply oxalic acid, why some treatments work best. Everybody else is stuck with proxies. They apply it and they see how many mites drop or much later what the infestation rate is. I don't have to wait for a proxy. I can go directly in there and say, oh, you got this many micrograms of acid in this bee. Uh, this application method distributes it unevenly. This one distributes it more evenly. And this is how much you get. So like with the uh, acid, oxalic acid vaporization, the, uh, the dose that is uh, approved right now is actually too low to get up to a level that is adequate to control the mites well. And uh, uh, a higher dose uh, gives you a better. So I can then plot out on what's your average per bee or, or uh, how well it's distributed. And do you find that this has the obvious benefit that the ones with the optimal dose in your hives? Absolutely. So then I do are the field hives trials. that do best. Yeah, so we had like to do a test on it. I did a, had 216 hives. 216 in a field trial this uh, summer, testing five different matrices, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the, the uh, cardboard or the, uh, or the felt um, to apply it to, and then three different formulations of ratios of oxalic acid to glycerin, plus I did it with citric acid. And then oh, the other, my other main avenue of research is that I got serious about a selective breeding program for varroa, resist, varroa resistant stock. Bees that can handle varroa by themselves. Now, many people, including myself, fooled themselves for years thinking, oh, I'm breeding for resistance. <laughs> but they're not, they're not really serious about it. They, they, they may be personally serious, but they're not going to do much. So we really started a very, very um, strong resistance program um, as a demonstration project for the commercial queen producers anywhere in the world, a reality check saying, can you use traditional breeding technique, which is you just set the goal. And the goal here is to maintain low mite levels throughout the year without doing any, quote, scientific type stuff, which turns most of the commercial queen producers off. So I'm not using any instrumental insemination, no single drone inseminations, no marker assisted selection, no freeze killed hygiene tests, no brood dissection, no massive record keeping. I simply do uh, mite washes. So we identify colonies that in which varroa levels do not build up and track them uh, with mite washes every month 
those in, that can keep mites from building, that maintain mite wash counts of zero, month after month, month for an entire year, we breed only from them. So it's just basically it's a technique of observation and selecting the ones that have the lowest. The range. observation being seeing what the mite level is yeah. on that colony. They maintain lack of the of fruit mite. So we eliminate about 98%. We breed off of only 2% out of 1,500 hives every year. Tremendously strong selected pressure, but no tedious scientific work other than just doing lots of mite washes that anybody can do. We're entering our seventh year now of this. So we've gone from having a single colony, Queen Zero, a fraction of 1%, tiny amount of our colonies emitting resistance, we're now pushing um, 50 to 70% of our colonies now uh, ha are exhibiting resistance. So we're finally starting to lock in, fixing the genetics to lock in heritability. It was very frustrating the first few years because you could have a colony that was immune to varroa mites, had zero mite counts for an entire year, made her out, but the daughters of that, only maybe 5% of the daughters would exhibit resistance. So obviously some of the alleles were coming from the drone pool. The problem is if you have a queen whose colony is resistant and then you made out the daughters, they're made out to a drone pool of which 90% came from colonies that were not resistant. All right. So it's slow beginning. So we're just approaching the tip point where it looks like 50% of our drone pool, not this year, but next year will come from resistant colonies. When you hit that tip point, now the norm, instead of being susceptible colonies, the norm becomes resistant colonies. And you shift from positive selection for the few colonies that are resistant to negative selection of eliminating the few colonies that are susceptible to mites. So uh, we're pretty excited about uh, getting to this point. That sounds really fascinating, but it also sounds as if once you disseminate this across the world, people have got to be patient and wait for the few years for their drones that's all. Yeah, so any commercial, I'm, I'm trying, this is, a demonstration project yeah. for the commercial queen producers. So, and I, and, and I'm, every year I did an update of the good, the bad, the ugly, the success, the, uh, the failures, and mainly the number of hours involved in it and the costs, which are pretty, pretty small. What, what I'm seeing now is many commercial producers, the question is one, can you just do it from your own stock? The answer is yes, but it's gonna take you a lot of years. The other thing is if you, then start with resistant stock, how you would maintain that and control the drone pool. So I'm demonstrating how to do that. So I'm not trying to sell anything. I'm not trying to claim anything. I'm just doing a demonstration project, walking the walk and saying, this is what, what happens. This is what you could probably expect if you follow this traditional breeding program. Well, that is fascinating. Thank you very much indeed. It's been really interesting talking to you. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that, um, your lectures this afternoon will be well attended and very much appreciated. Well, thank you. So thank you very much for coming to the show. All right, thank you.